Uh, welcome everybody to the Carmela Masterclass. This will be the last masterclass before summer vacation. Um, kind of fits well. I feel like people would rather spend their time outside. We're all zoomed out. Um, again, I, I really hope that we can have these presentations in person again starting soon. Um, first, we're going to talk about business and then we're going to talk about digital marketing. Um, as always, we want to have our marketing objectives ladder up to our business goals. So we want to make sure that these two things are always working together. Um, my name is Stephanie O'Brien and um, I want to just tell you a little bit about why I do what I do. Um, I love <clears throat> I love connecting with business owners. I love it when a business owner comes and brings me a specific problem. So they might say, you know what, we have this offering and because of COVID, we, we have no clients, like what are we gonna do? Or we have this new program and we don't know how to get it out there. And then they kind of give us free reign to work as a creative agency with our team of seven and come up with the best options and the best ideas. Um, it's really about you know points of leverage and creating relevant content um, and, and making sure that we connect with our followers and with our community. Um, Lily or Jackie, can one of you guys let that person in? Um, Lily, I'll make you the co-host. If you can go ahead and do that, please. Thank you. So, yeah, I've been in the Bow Valley since 1993. I like to say that I never really left. And... Um, yeah, if you, if you have any other further questions about what I just said there, I'm happy to connect with you as well. I was on a call with Janine just before this, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to chatting with all of you today. So we've talked a little bit about making sure that your video is on. So um, Beth, I would ask, and um, I don't know who's just joined us as well. Oh, hi, Dave. How are you doing? Perfect. I was just saying before you guys got here, it really helps me as a presenter to be able to connect with you, to know whether I'm boring you and you're falling asleep when I need to kind of speed up the pace, or maybe you're, you've got questions and it just, again, it really helps me. So thank you for that. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go around in a circle and I'm gonna ask you to just introduce yourself, your business and your current concerns. Okay, please and thank you. So, um, maybe what I'll do is uh, we'll get Sunshine to start. Is that okay? Sure. Uh, yeah, my name is Sunshine Chen. I run a uh, freelance video production company in the uh, in Camor. Uh, my clients are all away primarily, and I also co host Making Tonight with Steph, our new participatory broadcast platform <laughs> show. Uh, I make videos for clients from across the country and I guess current concerns. I just got called to start to look into doing a project back in Waterloo. And the question about how do I travel? Where do I stay? How do I film? How does quarantine impact? Mm -hmm me you know do I put 14 days on either side and uh, and what the provinces rolling out of how to control their borders are going to be like so yeah cool um Janine do you want to go next hi everyone I'm Janine I'm the director of stakeholder relations and development at Spirit North a not-for-profit charity organization based in Canmore um, our mission is to empower and inspire Indigenous youth through land-based sport and play. We have a reach across Canada, um, across five, excuse me, six different provinces and territories, reaching over 6,000 children and youth each year. Um, and I guess our biggest challenges right now are growing our audience and staying relevant and current amidst COVID-19 and uh, raising funds in this challenging economic climate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've asked uh, two of my staff to be here as well. Um, I, they're gonna tell you a little bit about what they do at um, Carmela, and then they're also gonna tell you a little bit about what they do 
um, as their as their side hustle. So um, Lily, I'll get you to go next. Hi, I'm Lily. I'm a content creator and social media manager at Carmela. And I also, as my side hustle, <laughs> um, have a bit of a social media presence myself. I am on YouTube and on Instagram. I have over 10,000 followers, subscribers on both platforms. And I've been working with companies like City of Calgary, Travel, Alberta, Telus. And my current concern right now is to how to go about the COVID situation in a sensitive manner. So when I do get requests to collaborate on a campaign with such big companies, it's a big concern right now how to go about it all sensitively. So yeah, that, that's me. Absolutely. Um, Dave, you want to go next? Yeah, I, I can. Am I muted? No, I'm good. Um, I'm usually muted. So uh, my name's Dave and uh i've i've got a business and and i you could call it maybe a side hustle uh, uh the business is i'm um uh in um i'm a product executive for a tech company called inveris uh we're a calgary austin based tech company um big part of what we do is social media presence through our intelligence offering and so i'm just interested in understanding um, how to be more effective on that. And I guess my side hustle is um, not-for-profit work. Uh, similar type of challenge is how to amplify social media messages um, for, you know, organizations that have zero resources. So that's, that's where I'm at. Awesome. Uh, Jackie, right? Jackie's with Carmela as well. Go ahead, Jackie. Yep, so I'm Jackie. I... I'm kind of the do everything girl at Carmela. Um, I've been with the company now for just over two years and my side hustle is kind of a mix of things. So I am a content creator. Um, I work for brands such as Bionica Shoes, uh, the Stoke Hotel and Smart Tent. So I just provide them with photography. And then I also run an elopement photography business as well. Um, I guess my main concern with COVID as far as elopement photography goes is how am I gonna manage everything? Um, people are kind of going crazy with elopements right now. They're just really excited that things are opening up. So I'm just trying to be selective with who I'm choosing so I don't kind of overwhelm myself um, cause Carmela obviously is my main focus and I just wanna have time for balancing all of the balls instead of just being overwhelmed. Awesome. Um, Beth, do you want to go next? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Beth Vandervoort, and I'm the executive director of the Downtown Canmore Business Association. Can you hear me? Yep, yep we're okay, good. Great. Um, I, I'm actually sitting across the office from Steph, so there might be a bit of um, rebound, uh, rebound of voices here. Anyways, um, so I guess um, my business is right now is like, how do I get through the summer? What do I need to keep doing? And um, of course, already the messaging for winter um, to draw people into the into the community and um, into their businesses. So. Um, that I think um, is probably a high priority for us as the, as the uh, representative of those businesses is to, you know, make sure our messaging um, aligns with um, what Travel Alberta is doing and at the same time um, promoting um, those folks. Um, so the two people um, regionally initially and then um, uh, working with Travel Alberta and tourism here in town um, outside of that area. So, um, yeah, so that's um, kind of where we're at at the moment. Right now, we're in the process, for those of you for, or that aren't in Camor, we're in the process of, uh, we've just pedestrianized um, two blocks of our main street. Um, the, the downtown association is in charge of uh, doing the enhancements on that. 
Um, we plan to do um, a promotion around that. Um, um, Carmela is um, works with us on our um, social media and marketing. So um, we'll be doing video, et cetera, to share with people and with the media outside of the community on, on how great we look right now and how safe it is for people to come and visit and be part of the experience here in Camor. Awesome. I, uh, I just turned my volume down, Beth, so that we didn't echo off each other there. <laughs> um, Dilla, do you want to go next? Hi, everybody. I'm Dilla. Uh, I'm an adventure elopement photographer here in Canmore. And my current concerns are because my, my business is focusing on mostly elopements and uh, the experience of the eloping, I guess eloping. Um, a lot of my previous clients are typically based in the States and it's a majority of my clients. And now that um, we have the restrictions, it's been, my audience have shifted to more locals. And, and I think I'm, I've been trying to um, I guess, kind of direct my focus into the local uh, potential clients rather than um, U.S. clients, which is a little bit of, um, uh, yeah, a, a change for me. <laughs> and it's, it's been a little bit difficult personally for me because um, of just my business structure right now. Yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of my concern. <laughs> Awesome. And Sylvia. Oh, we can't hear you, Sylvia. Sorry. We're unmuting. There we go. There we go. I'm Sylvia with Yamnaska Mountain Adventures. I'm the marketing manager and been there for quite a few years. Um, Yamnaska, we're a guiding and instruction company based in Canmore, so anywhere from mountain activities for summer and winter time hiking and rock climbing um, to uh, winter time skiing and ice climbing, all that kind of stuff. Um, I guess some of our concerns right now are partially operational in the sense that there is still some closures or um, in terms of overnight programming. Um, so changing up some of our programming a little bit to allow for our programs to still run, I guess, based on um, restrictions in the backcountry. So there are still some that we're dealing with and changing up our programs to deal with that. Um, the other thing, though, I think we've done relatively well, I think, over the course of time in terms or over the last few months in terms of engagement. Uh, with our customers and changing some of the marketing or some of the social media, I guess, that we've been doing over the last few months. But um, so now that we're transitioning out of the closures, um, kind of like Lily said, I guess, trying to steer a little bit more towards the sales side of things without seeming insensitive, um, while still maintaining that engagement, but trying to get people to come back and feel that uh, safety and security within the backcountry, I guess. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, did we do everybody? I think so, right? We got everyone? Okay. Um, perfect. So the concerns are meeting guidelines, how to drive sales, will customers come, are we safe, where to allocate our resources. So, you know, if we have no resources, how are we, uh, how are we you know, using those dollars that we don't necessarily have? And um, I would suggest on that points of leverage. So a conversation that Janine and I just had, you know, is how do we bring in a third partner um, to maybe identify some possible grants or bring in more partners to identify some possible grants instead of applying for 5,000, we're applying for 50,000, um, you know, and, and how do we, how is that a win, win, win? for everyone involved. So again, allocating resources. What, you know, the old methods maybe aren't working and um, is there anything else? So, you know, I also I wrote down that how to be sensitive, how to manage travel, how to amplify 
safety, what next, and operations. So I feel like we got a good kind of understanding of, of what everybody is, is faced with right now. Um, according to a recent survey, nearly 50% of respondents said they won't visit stores for a long time. That is not what we're seeing in Canmore. Um, that is maybe a very real scenario in a lot of other locations. I wish you guys were downtown right now because what I'm watching as I look out the window is they are painting um, six foot wide hearts in the middle of Main Street right now. And I can see um, a bunch of different workers kind of down on their hands and knees as they're there, you know, actually hand painting these hearts with their heart, I guess, right? In the middle of Main Street, it's pretty cool. Maybe we'll go out and get some Instagram stories here in a little bit. Uh, on Sunday, I biked through downtown Banff. I got in trouble for doing that because it's not the same regulations or rules in Banff as it is in Canmore. Canmore, you can bike on Main Street, Banff, you can't. And um, as a result of that, uh, anyway, it, I, we got in trouble for biking on Main Street and Banff. But one of the things I wanted to report, Canmore is busier. Banff is a bit of a ghost town right now. And I would suggest that there's probably a few reasons for that. One, Banff always attracts more international tourists and international visitors. Canmore does a great job of reaching out to its regional market. And two, we didn't close our doors. Um, so again, we tried to maintain some sort of open presence with the, not just the downtown core, but Canmore as a whole. And um, I think that also weighed into the fact of you know, people felt like they couldn't travel to Banff. They still kind of can't because some of the trails and things aren't open, whereas Canmore has really welcomed people. So we'll see what the long-term implications of that are for sure. Uh, this is your first pandemic. Hi, Alex. Nice to see you. <laughs> um, so, you know, as we live through this first pandemic, it is, it's pretty easy to imagine that there might be a second wave it's pretty easy to imagine that this might happen again. Uh, one of the things we're seeing with all of our realtor clients, as well as with um, all of the resumes that I'm getting into my inbox, is people from downtown Toronto who maybe don't even have a balcony in their downtown condo. And what they're saying is, now that I've experienced one pandemic, it's not hard to imagine that I'm gonna live through this again. I do not wanna experience the same thing. I do not want to be locked in a box in a tower, um, you know, in downtown, wherever. Um, I want to come to Canmore or I want to come to Banff or I want to go to Nelson or I want to go wherever. Um, just places where we have a little bit more, um, a little bit more access to outside, little smaller town. There's a, so I do think that we're going to see real estate prices go, I don't want to say through the roof, but maybe through the roof here. So that'll be a little bit of some predictions to make, but you know, what, what does the future hold? So knowing these sorts of things and reading the news and keeping up, you need to start to probably make some forecasts as well as some plans for what your organization might look like in the next 90 days and in the next year. Always try to do things in 90 day segments. That's a really nice kind of uh, chunk of time. So the lens that I want you to apply today is what now and what next? How do we build trust? This might be a great question for Sunshine because uh, he's the storyteller. So, you know, some of the ways that I think we build trust is through authenticity, um, through Google reviews, through humanizing your brand, through lots and lots and lots of communication um, targeted communication, right? We're not just trying to make noise. Um, but Sunshine, what are some other ways that you would consider to build trust? Um, I think right now, even expressing your commitment to be around, because it's not clear anymore um, for small, medium-sized businesses. And, uh, uh, and how do you share that story with people in how you kind of even organize your business now. Um, and also being really specific. Um, so I'll share a story like Linda went into Calgary this weekend and stopped at the big core mall center. So mm -hmm. the toilets in the washrooms are open 
but all of the hand washing stations have been closed off and you have no access to paper towels or or ability to wash your hands so i think there's a as you try to organize your stuff leaving people or not leaving people with a sense like what the hell is going on do these people know what they're doing um and offering reassurance that maybe you're trying the best you can you're seeing a lot of these small businesses working on how to configure how to reconfigure but also mm -hmm. i think you have to keep trying until you know make the, the, the adjustments until it really works and is frictionless for people and the mm -hmm. landscape i think is going to be really dramatically different in retail as I'm seeing across the board, like malls aren't going to be the same anymore. No. So, so I think as a business, I think you also, I think Steph, you're touching on it too. You're going to have a different role in society too. Like it's not just here, buy stuff from me, buy stuff from me safely. Know that this is a place that's safe for you. And the interactions, I think you're going to be, have to be far more sensitive than you were before because people may in fact be in kind of altered states or even triggered states when interacting with you and uh, making sure that you and your employees are kind of ready for that. Those are some thoughts. Awesome. Does anybody else have anything they want to add to that? Yeah, we work a lot with um, clients on 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 building. You know, ultimately, it's a trust business what we do, even though it's software and stuff like that. But they need to trust it. Um, we have simple rules. The simple rules we live by are: do, uh, um, say what you're going to do, uh, do do what you said you were going to do, um, uh, and essentially be predictable. Right. So, um, where we find we lose trust with clients is if we act in a way that's not predictable, if, if, if we don't, aren't very clear with our intentions and then carry through with our intentions. Uh, and the more often we do that, even if, even if it doesn't meet their specific needs, um, they, they at least trust that, um, they, they begin to trust you because of the predictability. And we think about the same with leaders. I mean, people are gonna make mistakes businesses are going to make mistakes but you can trust them a whole lot more if they kind of follow that formula is what we've kind of come up with awesome that's great i i would use the word you know consistency in there as well for sure um awesome so in your messaging right it, you instead of focusing on location 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 it's kind of what um linda sunshine's wife linda experienced right you need to talk about cleanliness, sanitation, and security. So what do what should people expect? That's what Dave just said, right? So forecast that for them, let them know what to expect. And yeah, that, that's definitely a big part of what everybody's messaging should look like right now. And we heard that, you know, from, from everyone as well. One of the cool things that we um, have seen that's popped up in the last little bit is um, a company called Bow Valley Safety has a app that they can, well, any business can use it, but it basically tracks, um, it tracks your customers. It would track your staff. Um, oh, I do see Haley downtown now taking pictures of the main street. So <laughs> that's awesome. Um, but anyway, Bow Valley Safety. So they've got a really cool app and you can you can track um you basically just track the ins and outs so someone comes in um have they met you know have they like have they taken their temperature or if it's required um have they used the sanitation station if it's required um these sorts of things and you can customize it for your for your own business but that is definitely something they had the app in place before COVID hit before the pandemic and then there's been a really huge desire for that as well um, maybe if uh, Jackie wants to just drop that in the link um, in the chat maybe that would be uh, something cool for everyone to check out as well it might just help you um, understand as well what other businesses are doing so 
um, video works as well. This was a video that our, our team put together. I'm gonna go ahead and let it play. It just gives you an idea of what what sort of messaging people are expecting. Now, this was posted a month ago. So, you know, we're in phase two now, which is a little bit further ahead than where we were before, but uh, I'll go On the 27th of March, 2020, the Malcolm Hotel made the socially responsible decision to temporarily shut our doors. While closed, it was our honor to be able to support our community through Canmore Soup for the Soul. Together, we have raised nearly $15,000 for the Bow Valley Food Bank. Thank you, Canmore. The Malcolm Hotel has been dedicated to taking care of our guests, staff, and community with a focus on exemplary service, quality, and trust. We have taken this time away to redefine our procedures, assuring the highest standards are in place for your health and safety. Things will most certainly look a little different when you come back to visit us. Our team will not only be adhering to the government and health services recommendations, but exceeding them. Cleaning frequencies and standards have increased in all areas of King Malcolm's Castle. Hand sanitation stations and signage has been installed to remind guests of our social responsibilities. Our dedicated team is committed to providing you with a safe environment. When you arrive in your room, know that your legendary housekeeping team has paid attention to every detail. We have joined forces with Equalab, a global leader in hygiene. This allows us the confidence to know that all products used to prepare your room are tested, approved, and exceed the government's guidelines. You can be assured that your health and safety is top of our minds and that all services have been thoroughly cleaned. Your Sterling Grill and Lounge Team has been closely monitoring Alberta health guidelines. For your dining pleasure, our limited menu will now be offered as takeaway or dine-in. When you are ready to dine with us, you will notice that we have rearranged our dining areas, guaranteeing and more importantly surpassing protocol distance between all patrons. We are extremely happy to provide you with one of the largest patios in the Canadian Rockies, allowing eight to 10 feet between tables. Now, let's all put out positive vibes for some amazing weather so that we can come together while adhering to our new social responsibilities. It may not be time for you yet, but when you are ready, our legendary Malcolm Hotel team will be ready to host you. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay legendary. So when you, you can use video to convey messages for sure. It doesn't have to be polished. It can be just a Facebook Live or an Instagram Live. Um, I just wanna talk for a few minutes about some post-pandemic trends that we're seeing. And this really ties into the what now approach that I want you to sort of use when we're, we're talking about this. We see many workplaces shifting to the home. Uh, Twitter, for example, they announced I'd say probably about two weeks ago now, that they will allow their employees to work from home forever. So that is something that Twitter has done for sure. Um, I know that I see most people kind of still working from home. Most of our team will return to the office um, starting on Friday. And uh, we have lots of space to spread out into and we feel like we can meet all of the safety measures. So that's something that we are doing internally. Um, you're going to see contactless payments. So I want you to think this through for a second. Alex, we could probably use your help on this one. Um, imagine when you go to a shoe store and you want to get a pair of shoes. When you arrive there, if you could take a biometric scan of your foot shape, choose a style of shoe that you like, and basically be like, that shoe I like and the sales associate would say that's going to fit you no problem we have your size here's your shoes um, how are you how are you going to try on shoes how are we going to have contactless payments so until this virus is completely eradicated or there's a vaccine in place you know safety measures such as these are going to become even more commonplace and probably will stick around until well after the crisis is over there's a fair amount of convenience and ease of use as well. Has anyone else seen other uh, industries, um, whether it's retail or anything else, um, where they're starting to look at innovation to make these changes? Sylvia, do you have anything you want to add here? What are you guys kind of considering right now? 
just you'll have to unmute yourself before you talk sorry keep forgetting there sorry um you know all of our payments have or the majority of our payments are done either like remotely online that kind of thing so there's no changes in that side of things for us i mean we've changed a lot of our operations in terms of our for guiding um how we distribute gear, how we clean all of our gear. I mean, that's always been done, but in terms of sanitizing, disinfecting offices, um, handing out gear to people that they need to only touch versus, um, you know, shared equipment, that kind of thing. So we're making changes to our operations, but in terms of innovations, I wouldn't say that, you know, there's been a whole lot of change that we've had to make, just how we use our current systems. Okay. Um, I'll be interested to kind of probe a little deeper there and see if there's new business units that have evolved, you know, in this time as well, right? Yeah. Um, there's been a big focus on self-improvement. So as people were locked down, um, you know, there's an increased demand for products in the health and wellness category. There's a new trend towards um, either D2C, which is direct to consumer, or M2P, which is mentor to protege services. Um, so D to C would be sales, uh, M to P would be um, services essentially, where consumers can, or customers essentially can connect online with experts, teachers, mentors to advance their skills and achieve their personal goals. So kind of similar to maybe what we're doing here today with this class as well. Uh, interactions are going virtual. So just like what we're doing right now, we used to have these classes face to face. Um, I know personally, I'm, I'm, I've got Zoom fatigue. And so I have a, a period of my day that's blocked out to do all my Zoom meetings in. And then I try not to take Zoom meetings um, after that. And I just try to focus on client work and project work and things like that instead. Uh, it's made a big difference in my mental health, for sure, <laughs> uh, not having Zoom meetings all day long. And I, I see an awful lot of people nodding here. So I know I know you're getting it, for sure. Uh, it's That's a lot of great. time behind you. Oh, oh sorry, I, I go ahead. I was just going to jump in, I guess, you know, when you talked about innovations, um, not so much with our typical programming. It just, you kind of made me rethink it, my answer a little bit. But in terms of you know, during it, we, during the, the pandemic, we've, you know, been providing, I guess not classes per se, but we've, uh, you know, been providing instructional or educational information online a little bit. We've also been developing and it's just, we're just starting some of it, some of our more online, like technical tips for people climbing, that kind of thing. So it's not our full operations or programming that have changed, but I guess introducing people to some of the skills that we would normally teach, I suppose, um, face to face. The, Absolutely. the other thing that's interesting yeah. is, um, you know, we, we talk about Zoom fatigue, but we also talk about Zoom. I think, A, we shouldn't um, productize it. It's not Zoom. So video, video fatigue, because uh, we use Teams. So, um, you know, there's different platforms, but um, it also creates opportunity, right? Like says, I would never join one of your in-person classes because I likely wouldn't be here. And uh, it's just difficult to actually, you know, organize my life, but I was able to this time. Uh, and so we're seeing a lot of that as well, just kind of being able to converse with our client base we're, and, and colleagues. So historically where you just did it by phone and, and what I'm thinking, uh, you know, in terms of you, Sylvia at YAM, you know, I'm a customer of YAM and, you're in a you're in a business where trust is actually pretty important right because you got you got to trust that the guide you're hiring is gonna you know do the job or the organization is safety conscious and so you can actually boost that by offering um you know so if you're going to do trip planning session instead of doing a call like i have done in the past with yam um you actually do a um you know you can do a video chat because then you can read the people you get more trust out of them you can see uh, maybe the guide or the individuals across from you and you're like, yeah, I get, I get it. Right. So anyway, just some comments. Yeah, we've done a little bit, uh, David, just a little bit of that as well, I guess, not so much in terms of the, you know, education side of things, but, uh, for our longer programmings, um, 
like you said, I think that interaction ahead of time, realizing the importance of face-to-face, I guess, even if people aren't directly with you, you can communicate with them, get a team together and introduce people up front instead of it being just last minute when people get together. So I think there is some benefit to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Community. Awesome. Um, people are looking to economize. So essentially they, they want to save money or they want to feel like they're getting value. Um, you know, having an in-person conference where you get to chat with other like-minded people or other individuals or the presenters has always been uh, a huge benefit to attending an in-person conference. You don't get that same sort of interaction um, when you have a um, when you have a Zoom conference. Sunshine uh, and uh, myself and a few others um, have kind of figured out how to create a participatory broadcasting experience. And uh, we're not going to dive into that right now, but we're happy to talk to you more about that. So if you have a fundraiser that you need to run uh, and you still want to get your 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars, whatever it might be out of the evening, uh, we've come up with a model in order to help organizations uh, and nonprofits go ahead and do that. So we're happy to chat with you a bit more about that too. So stories, stories, stories. Um, in March, I don't have any data from any further than kind of the end of March, but 40% of Instagram users and about 35% of Facebook user, users were watching other people's stories. That was up significantly. Uh, the shift towards open communication and authenticity and brand marketing is huge and that storytelling will continue to drive consumer interest. So how do you create those stories that are relevant, timely, and memorable? Okay, those are kind of the most important things. Sylvia, you worked with Carmela for a while, so you've heard about our litmus test before, but we have a litmus test where we always want to say every piece of content we produce could be considered as award-winning. And the way we evaluate that is we apply what's called the Carmela litmus test. And the Carmela litmus test, it looks at every post and says, okay, is this post timely? Um, is it served at a time when this customer is looking for this information? Is it relevant to their needs and to their pain points? And lastly, is it memorable? Is it more than just a picture with an emoji? Does this post or this blog achieve a higher strategic purpose? So we're going to see a big surge in travel and experiences. I read this morning that Canadians can now travel to Europe again. Uh, the, the border from the U.S. has not necessarily been reopened into Europe, but Canadians can travel to Europe. And I do think we're going to see an en masse to trips and vacations. We've all worked our asses off over the past 14 or 15 weeks and didn't take any vacations, didn't take any days off. We just worked, worked, worked. And, and now we're like, oh my God. And then the other half is the people who went on CERB and have had the vacation for you know that period of time, but in place. So I think there's gonna be more um, travel experiences for sure. So 70% of consumers or customers plan to spend a cautiously extravagant uh, holiday in two categories. One is act activities or leisure, and the other one is vacations and holidays. And they plan to return to experience-based marketing initiatives when the all clear is finally given, given and social distancing is kind of a thing of the past. So there's two sort of thoughts there. Um, purpose and social good are more important than ever. Everybody's heard of CSR content, corporate social responsibility. Yep. Okay. Um, that's really, really doing very well right now. It has for the past six weeks. Again, if you can put out some posts or, or content about what you're doing to help the community as a whole, or what you're doing in your organization to support your team, that is really, really important. Um, we want you to build brand authenticity and social values, okay? Um, but it's just becoming even more central to customer perception. So 50% of adults are saying that they're willing to share location data. 84% are willing to share health data in order to help curb the spread of the virus. But over 80% are concerned with how their data is gonna be used when the pandemic is over. 
Is the background noise bothering you guys or is it okay? It's okay? Cool. Uh, I forget who said this. It might have been Sylvia. So increase in online media usage. Do you want to guess what our online media usage is in hours per day, the average? Let's hear some numbers. Four. Okay. I was going to say even higher, potentially five or six. Yeah, it's increased by one hour to 13 hours and 35 minutes per day. That's wow. the average. Um, so I think, you know what, I look at it and I'm like, oh, I only use my phone like two hours a day for the last week because my it gives me an update, you know, at the end of every week. And I was like, that's pretty good. And then when I add up all the hours that I spent behind this thing and, you know, the fact that maybe we're like watching a show together, like my husband and I at home in the evenings, then, you know, there's another 60 minutes. Um, Again, it all adds up. There's so much screen time for sure. So I find that kind of interesting, but opportunity is knocking. If people have increased their media uh, usage by one hour, um, you know, again, how do we get in front of them? How do we create meaningful messages and how do we get in front of them? This is all part of the what now and tying into what next. So we generally are looking for leads, sales, subscriptions, or awareness. And I was reading this morning that Walmart just announced a partnership with Shopify to explain, expand their uh, marketplace. So with that news, the shares rose by about seven, seven and a half percent. Um, it's obviously a direct th threat against Amazon, which could be good. Uh, but anyway, it'll, it'll be interesting to, to see what happens. It really makes me wish that I could go back in time and buy some Shopify stock. Uh, I definitely, um, I, I could not, uh, afford that right now. So if any of you have it, I'm just envious. That's really all I am. <laughs> so that's great. Uh, let's talk about what next. So your digital. Sorry, Steph, can you go, go back to that? Just a question yeah. there, um, previous one. What do we mean by subscription, sir? Sure. So sometimes um, if I do a presentation, I've always got like a nonprofit organization in the, in the crowd that will say, I'm not trying to generate leads for my products. I'm not trying to make sales. I'm, uh, I'm trying to find people who want to contribute to my endowment or I'm not trying to get people to subscribe to my blog. Um, again, there's always people who have a bit of a different approach. When I talk about subscriptions, it can be either subscriptions to an app. So, you know, we've got people that we work with that have a, an app and are trying to build a following of um, partner businesses as well as um, people who are gonna like download and use the app. But also, um, you can look at it as, a, are you buying customers for now or are you buying customers for later? And what I mean by that is, if you're not running a direct sales campaign and buying customers, like buying pro having people purchase from you right now, you're likely buying customers for later, which is, fits into the lead approach, but it also fits into people subscribing to your blog so that you can then continue to talk to them, right? Does that yeah. kind of answer your question? Yeah, it does. And, and I, the reason why I ask is, is you know, we've, I, we focus very, 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 very uh, acutely on that term subscription in our business because um, just from a uh, enterprise value perspective, if you get subscription like revenue, um, for example, if, if you can sell something like, um, uh, you know, something that looks like a, a multi-year type of rela relationship or, or even if it's, if it's annual, but a subscription, like, um, it's worth, um, you know, it's worth 20 to 30 X in terms of valuation, um, than, than just a one-time sale. Um, so it's an interesting concept to think about. I mean, it's, that's why like season pass holders are, are, they're not actually, they're actually the most valuable, 
uh, revenue stream a ski hill can have because it's worth 20 times the one time ticket buyer, uh, even for dollar for dollar. Anyway, just a, just a tidbit there. It was, it was interesting because it, it, we focus on that one a lot, um, mm -hmm. having that annual uh, recurring revenue type item. Awesome. That would be um, maybe similar to uh, a retainer as well, Dave, right? Like you'd have retainer clients, yep. is that? Yeah, it's a it's like a hundred percent. Like, yeah, I mean, our our exactly like anything that you can buying clients, selling them something now versus selling them something forever, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can create a product or an experience that sells them something forever, uh, mm -hmm. that's awesome. That's why Shopify, frankly, even Amazon is, it's not what they sell today. It's the fact that you're in a relationship with something that like goes on, right. That kind of, uh, like, that's why Amazon prime is such a, a valuable asset because it is, it is, is you're selling some, you're selling something that has retention longer term. And what it offers you the ability to do is actually price it really quite affordably. Like in the context of like, I've, I've thought about it. Like, um, c could you have something even as silly as a bike subscription, right? Where instead of buying a bicycle, uh, at discrete times every four years or three or depending, you actually pay a monthly fee to just have a really good bike for a period of time that swaps over. And I know automobile companies are trying with this because it's, it's just a way better way of managing both your business uh, and selling something of, and the value that say somebody's going to pay you for it or how much you can borrow against it is just is way more. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I look at our car, which sits in our yard. I've put one tank of gas in it since March. Um, what do I need a car for? You know, like again, the subscription model probably would work really well. For, for someone like myself, where you have high high usage and high volume in the winter and then don't really use it in the summer. So, yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about what next, all right? So your digital footprint, what are you currently doing? How are you filling your pipeline? That is a question I always ask people. Um, what is a, What are all the things that you're doing to drive leads or sales or subscriptions or awareness? Uh, and you should have a list, okay? And the way, the reason you wanna have a list is for example, so we always have what's called a 10 by 10, which means we have 10 marketing strategies that we are using to drive sales. What we did is when COVID hit in March, I rebuilt the 10 by 10 and we launched as fast as we could 10 new marketing strategies uh, each one had a budget associated with it, which was not much because we didn't know what the future was going to look like. And then what we did is we watched and we evaluated, okay, so we spent this much money. Uh, we got this many leads. We know what our cost per lead was. We made this many conversions. Okay, so now we know what our cost per acquisition was as well, or our cost per sale. And Always, 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 every 90 days, I want you looking at your 10 by 10 and recreating or at least evaluating your, your sales and marketing tactics. And that's how you're going to tie these things together. So if you tell me, Dave, that you're going to advertise on podcasts because no one's picking up print media anymore, I'm going to say, okay, awesome. Let's figure out what your budget's going to be. Um, let's figure out which types of podcasts we're going to advertise on. Um, and let's figure out how we're going to track those leads effectively. Um, because Rogers media did a study not so long ago where they ran a bunch, a big campaign and they ran it in a variety of platforms. And then they asked everyone, they said, where did you hear about this campaign? So people, when they were self-reporting and they had the options like on the radio, on TV, whatever it might be. And um, I think it was 30% of the people reported seeing the ad on TV uh, and the ad was never, ever even placed on TV at all. So, you know, people, the self-reporting were just, were not that accurate. Our memories are not that good. 
So I want you to make sure that we're tracking everything that we do. It is so, so, so important. And that is honestly what we spend an awful lot of time at Carmela helping our clients do is figure out how can we use your CRM? How can we track this? How, you know, how can we get inside your organization to help show ROI so that Dave, we do what you just suggested and that is create customers for life. So the customer journey for your business, um, everyone has heard me say this before, you know, we used to have to see things seven times for us for it to really resonate with us. That number is now 56. So there are 56 different points of attribution uh, on a path to purchase or on the journey for someone um, making a sale. So for example, I'm gonna pick Sylvia again. Sylvia, you might have sat in on a masterclass, you know, two or three years ago, and then you kind of keep seeing our marketing pop up, you joined our newsletter, um, you know, and, and eventually it kind of gets to the point where you have a pain point and you know, because you've already, we've already been that kind of sharing education and sharing knowledge without expectations. Um, we've already been inside your your circle in a way without you really even knowing it. So then, you know, you get a proposal from us and a proposal from a few other people um, and it makes it an easier decision. So I give you that information for, for you to use as well. Um, that customer journey, I think is going to be even more complicated now with how much we need to build trust. So I think likely most organizations now have two different business models. Okay, and each one is going to need a different strategy. So you might have your website, okay, and you might have a physical location as well. And, and both of them are going to need a different, a different set basket of um, things or a different toolbox holding different tools or whatever analogy you want to you wanna put in there. Um, prior to COVID, we found that uh, customers were shop, spending more when they shopped in person than when they were shopping online. Now that people are buying everything online, I don't know if that's really the case anymore, uh, but I would like to see this trend broken. And I would also like to know if anyone's tracking this and has any data to share. So I see that Beth doesn't have her video on, uh, but this is something that I would love to know from say, for example, from the BIA. So let's talk about a digital strategy for e-commerce for a few seconds. I know we're getting close to the end of class here and we're getting close to the end of my slides as well. So video, video, video. Um, we are making sure that we are um, helping our clients with their video as much as possible. Uh, having, having good video that tells a really authentic story that's gonna resonate with your customer is so important. Um, in terms of what we're doing in social media right now, I feel like the number one thing we're doing is testing. Um, so we might create a bunch of posts that we think are going to work and then we'll create an outlier just to see if that might be the one that works. When it comes to um, blogs, which is our next point, we're writing um, a lot of cornerstone content. So we're using a, basically a pillar and cluster approach with most of our clients. Um, where we would write a, a cornerstone content piece um, that's quite long, that incorporates a lot of our SEO keywords from the keyword research we would do. Uh, and then we will write a bunch of cluster blogs that all drive people back to that. And that approach is working really, really well for a lot of our clients in all different industries. So it's not just one industry that's working there. The other little secret sauce that um, the team has discovered is, uh, is Pinterest. And I might ask uh, either Jackie or Lily to jump in and talk a little bit about Pinterest and how it's not actually social media. Uh, do I have a volunteer? I can do. Um, yeah, we've done a lot of research on Pinterest lately and it's incredible what you can achieve from that, how much traffic you can drive towards your website through Pinterest, how you can take one piece of content, one blog, one photo, <clears throat> and spin it in so many different ways, create so many different pins that you will 
put into different boards on your Pinterest account, how you can join different, what they call tribes for Pinterest. Um, there is a software called Tailwind, I think. Yes, and they put together all the like-minded people who are trying to achieve something off of Pinterest and it's working very well. It's very authentic. It, pushes out your pins in a very authentic way, uh, triggering the algorithm um, for Pinterest to keep pushing your pins even higher. And the more people will see your pins, the more people will come to your website to check out your content. And it stays there forever because Pinterest is essentially a search engine. It's not just your regular social media platform where you post something and then you scroll down and you can't even find that piece of content anymore it's always there and yeah we found that our Carmela website gets a lot of traffic from through Pinterest so yeah it's been pretty interesting to see how our personal not personal our business Pinterest grows and what it does to our traffic and yeah it's it's amazing and it could be used for so many industries as well been pretty good we're impressed <laughs> awesome I think as well as if you all take a look at the stats they're really interesting um for example pinterest just poured billions of dollars into research because they're finding that obviously their target market is mostly females between the age of 25 to 55 with a yearly salary of around seventy-five thousand dollars u.s so they poured a whole bunch of money into bringing more of the male demographic into Pinterest. So if you take a look at those stats, it's just really interesting and it'll kind of help you with the direction you're going with respect to Pinterest. That's awesome. Thank you guys. Um, events, I don't really know what events are gonna look like in the future. Um, Dave just jumped off, but the um, the ski team did a um, just a casual bike bring like ride with your parents ride with your kids kind of bike ride um, and in the past pre COVID they would have had six to ten people show up and uh, they did this last weekend on Saturday and they had over they had fifty which was lucky just fifty um, people show up to ride with their kids and everybody broke into groups and rode together and it was really nice so. Again, events are gonna look different. Uh, discounts and sales, that was one of the tactics that we took. We ran a spin to win, uh, a sale um, on our, basically a website sale for 10 days in April. We had 11 leads come in and so far we've had eight of those leads close. So pretty high conversion rate there. Um, again, people who probably weren't even really thinking about getting a new website, but they, you know, they did the spin to win, they felt like they got a deal and, Anyway, it was awesome. I mean, they did get a deal, but yeah, it was, it was really cool to, to watch that whole process happen. Uh, Google reviews. So I don't know. I don't know if our Google reviews is working because we haven't gotten a Google review in months. Um, so I can't tell you who they're letting uh, have listings again or like have reviews come through. Uh, I in reviews right now um, and I know builders are getting reviews but we haven't gotten a review since the pandemic started so that either means that we're not doing things to help people and that people don't feel like leaving us reviews maybe we're not asking for them or um, I'm not sure exactly so I, I would ask if anybody has a spare moment after the class to you know if, if you felt like you got good value from it and want to leave us a Google review I'd be interested to see if we actually get it so um, as always, we want to remove barriers to entry and increase conversions through conversion rate optimization. So this is um, something that we look at your website and we actually make sure that you have the right calls to action. Janine, you and I went through like two seconds of conversion rate optimization on your website before this call. Makes a huge difference in leads and sales and subscriptions and things like that. And then your points of leverage. So again, I mentioned how do you how do you leverage those dollars that are available that are out there right now? Any grants, any programs, um, any anything to kind of you know points of leverage. How do we make that work for us? 
Next is if you have a physical store, is there anybody? Um, do, you, do you want me to go through this slide or do you want me to skip this slide? Because you don't really have a physical store. Sylvia, you'd be the only one that I would want to ask that question of. Can I get a thumbs up if you want me to go through it or a thumbs down if you want me to skip it? Thumbs up. Okay. Is there a little quick version that you could just yep. run through? <laughs> so um, your digital strategy for a physical store. So how, what are you using um, in the digital space to bring people to your physical store? It's Google My Business. It's a really strong SEO strategy. It's making sure that you're telling your brand story. Having an, attracti an attractive storefront is really important. Uh, referral campaigns and referral traffic uh, is also really important. Your ambassadors, so um, you know everybody knows what I mean by ambassadors, your influencers, and your video. Uh, then how do you connect the two? So to the customer, it should all be seamless, whether they encounter the brand in person on social media, via text, or, or online. Um, so how, how are you connecting those two together? Loyalty programs are a great way to ask customers to share their data and request permission for contact. But really, you need someone to, to either give you their email address in person or to give you a contact in person, and then you can tie the whole thing together. Um, through retargeting, remarketing, um, as well as through, you know, when they come in the store. Um, but with the right technology, you want to carry on your conversation, okay, with your customers, no matter where they are. We want to make sure, obviously, we get permission to communicate with them, right? Uh, but we want to create a closer relationship through digital and in-personal contact. And we want to make sure that we're delivering the value that they expect. Jackie put me on to a company called uh, Very Good Butchers, and I signed up for their newsletter. Uh, they have the cutest drip campaign that I've seen yet. Like, I'm waiting for the next email. Like I, I think about this on a regular basis. I'm like, I got the first one. It was really awesome. I got the second one. It was, it was really cute too, and there was a little sales at the bottom. Um, but I'm like, all right, I'm ready for the third one. And I keep waiting. It's been like, I think it's been seven days or so. Um, and I haven't gotten it yet. So I, again, it's, um, you know, they, they've got me. Uh, I haven't ordered from them yet, but I know when I'm ready to order, um, I'll have to order this product, hide it in Jackie's fridge, because my husband will probably not allow me to have it at home. And, um, but I'll get to enjoy it at least. So, and anyway, that's a joke. If you, if you already know, my husband does all the cooking. That's, that's kind of the, the point of the whole thing. Um, most importantly, I want you to test and track. We're in a new environment. No one is an expert at marketing during a pandemic. Um, collectively, we've definitely figured a few things out. I think as an organization, as a business, as a company, uh, we've gotten a lot clearer about what we want from our future and you know what, what our future is going to look like. We have done a ton of testing, right? And a ton of tracking. Uh, but again, no one's an expert right now. So I just, I really encourage you for your industry to be, oh, we have someone who's just coming back. Rob Seeley's just joining us for the, for the last moment here. So that, um, that's basically wrapping up the presentation. Um, it's 12.07 right now. We have um, about another seven minutes for questions. So I'm going to open the floor if anybody wants to ask any questions. Steph, I guess one question, um, you know, you talked about um, your e-commerce and one thing that we had talked about when the pandemic kind of first started up and what strategy we might have moving forward and um, looking at the value or I guess what customers would want potentially looking at you know, online experiences and or classes and courses, that kind of thing versus the in-person and trying to determine, you know, is that moving forward? Is that something that you've seen or that people will, you know, at the end of this, are people still going to be looking for that experience or do they still want that in-person or will they be craving that in-person, I guess, experience and, you know, what to, 
you know, put money into what to look at that way? My gut instinct on this one is that there is a significant um, portion of the population that is, is not comfortable yet and may not be comfortable until uh, there's a vaccine. So they, especially if they're over the age of 60, which I'm guessing, you know, is for some of your parts are. Are, Yeah, yeah for some of them. Um, they're, they're at risk. I mean, it would definitely not be a good PR story, right? If, um, you know, people could trace back the fact that they had picked this up while on course or in a cabin or something while with Yam. Um, but again, I would say our businesses will never look the same our need to travel may never be the same. This is not the first time this is is going, we're probably gonna experience this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and not everyone is okay with, uh, um, you know, all scenarios. So again, how do we make, how do we make people feel comfortable? How do we communicate that trust um, and, there, there is no right answer on this one. I would say when people stop tuning in, like you've done an amazing job at creating this educational content and getting a huge audience to follow you guys for it. Um, so like that was, that was amazing. And you did it really quickly as well. So how yeah, do you I build a business? Looking team? at, looking at partially, you know, this has all been something that we've just been providing, you know, going down the road, you know, is it something that people would be willing to, register for, you know, potentially put even, you know, some sort of payment down for, you know, versus that in, you know, in-person experience, I guess. Can you build it as part of the experience? There's a book called um, The Experience Economy and um, probably read it like seven, seven or eight years ago, but obviously stuck with me. And it just talked about how there's, you know, a bunch of different ways to uh, different types of economies, essentially. And if you can create that experience, right, you're going to create uh, someone who's who's a Yamneska lifer, like, you know, someone who wants to be an ambassador for you and someone who wants to always be part of what you have going on. So, you know, how how can you build the virtual experience into what you're already doing have you looked at using uh ar at all right like there's an option uh that technology is just skyrocketing right now so how do you tie that in no answers just more questions right. <laughs> lots of questions <laughs> yeah. so. hey, hey staff can i make a point yeah please yeah i i just wanted to say the what I think is really interesting about what COVID is doing is it's not just changing our way of reimagining our experience or experiences with products and services, but it's actually a chance to re, re or change your relationship with your clients. And it's pretty fundamental. And I think an example with Yamnuska you know, like how can you leverage the fact that there are people that are under lock and key and afraid to come out now, afraid enough that they won't even spend time with their families to say, you have this expertise of wilderness adventuring and survival, and how could you package? I've watched uh, some friends of mine have started a new project in Cochrane, and uh, they've posted family uh, adventure outings where they learn survival skills and so mm-hmm. forth, but instead of COVID as the problem, but see it as the opportunities, how would your experts in adventure and guiding help families come together to experience the wilderness safely or more safely, and that you become a trusted source for how to survive and thrive in a pandemic, as opposed to I've lost all of this stuff, but there's an expertise. And this is the larger point also is that 
right now we can reimagine how we want to relate, what expertise and skills. So even when you were talking about inspire, like it's not just what you do, but how you do and how you've done things that's really valuable and worth sharing now in ways that build trust and create a deeper relationship with the people you already interact with. Well, that was a powerful statement. <laughs> Thanks, Sunshine. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I uh, just wanted to ask Sylvia if they do any merchandise, because if you do have clients for life and they can't go and see you right now in person for your tours, I think there might be a little bit of a business from that point of view. People would want to purchase, I don't know, a baseball cap or a hoodie or something with the, you know, branding that they really enjoy and love and miss doing and could be a part of that. Could be some business there. And it wouldn't require you communicating directly with people. So it would be on the safer side of things. awesome anybody anybody else hi rob sorry you joined us late it's all good how you doing i'm good yeah sorry i had a ceo council meeting but i jumped in as soon as i could sounds like yeah, a no good discussion nice to see you all we um this will be on youtube um probably within a few days so you'll be able to just watch you know any okay. of it if you you. Okay. Appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so if there's no further, any other further questions? Okay, great. If there's no further questions, we'll, uh, we'll sign off. Um, thanks everyone so much for your time today. It really means a lot to me that you're, that you're here, um, that you're wanting to connect with us and that you're wanting to share your expertise. As I said, no one's an expert right now. So, you know, the more we can test and try things and figure out what's working for our organizations, uh, I think the stronger we're all gonna be. So again, just really, really thank each of you for being here. Um, I hope everyone has a great summer and I'll see all of you, I'm sure, in the next few weeks anyway. <laughs> so thanks everybody and thanks to my team for being here to support us as well. <laughs>